When I was barely 16 years old, just a little bit after my 16th birthday in early May, I watched my father die of a heart attack. After the ambulance took his body away, I remember going out on the street, maybe three or four in the morning, and thinking how angry I was at God for letting him die. He was 53 years old. It would be a long time before I would talk to God again. I think there are a lot of people who are like I was when I was 16, mad at God because something bad has happened to themselves or someone they love. As a matter of fact, there are many people in this world who cannot seem to believe in God because they can't accept the idea that a good and merciful God would allow so much evil and misery and suffering to happen in this world. If I could go back in time, there are many things I'd like to explain to that angry teenager about why a good God allows suffering in this world. The first thing I talk about would be the problem of evil itself. Answering that question requires us to examine evil you know, up closely. There are two kinds of evil in the world. One is natural evil where things just happen to us without our willingness. Fires, accidents, disease, earthquakes, all of the many things that just happen that cause suffering and death. And then there's moral evil where human will and human action are in evidence. Crime, violence, immorality, selfishness. You know, the things that people do to themselves and do to other people in order to make them suffer. The problem of evil in this world is that it first of all affects both the innocent and the guilty. There doesn't seem to be any justice. Sometimes innocent people suffer. This is a sad reality of life. Some people think that a good and all-powerful God, what the Christian concept of God is, that a good and all-powerful God could and should prevent evil if He wanted to. So there are people who want to believe, who have heard the gospel, but they look at the problem of evil and they refuse to accept a God who would allow evil and, it affect, and its effects to exist in this world. It's, it's, the, it's the, the bridge too far, it's the mountain too high for them to, to climb. In order to help develop faith, despite the evil we see in the world, we need to understand three things. First of all, where evil comes from. Secondly, why it exists. And thirdly, how does God actually respond to evil? So let's start with the source and the reason. Evil in all of its forms is the result of disobedience to God and His laws. It began with the disobedience of Satan before the creation of the world, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. It continued with the successful temptation by Satan of Adam and Eve to disobey God, Genesis 3, 1 to 7. And it multiplied as the descendants of Adam and Eve continued to disobey God and His laws until this very day and to the end of the world. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. In other words, evil has been there since almost the beginning and will be there all the way to the end. Now the result of this disobedience is the evil that we see in the world today and the suffering that is caused by it. We see it expressed in both moral and natural evil. Moral evil causes suffering. You know, the violence and the immorality, the hatred in the world is caused by man's unwillingness to love and obey God and to love his neighbor as himself. Not just, not just ignorance and poverty. Ignorance and poverty are the result of sin, not the cause of sin. If you could trace every crime, every broken home, every case of emotional and physical abuse, at its root you would find pride and lust and selfishness and anger. You would find, in a single word, you would find sin. Either someone is guilty of it 
or someone is victimized by it. Paul says that the wage of sin is death, Romans 6, 23, and death is manifested in this world through evil, not just funerals. I mean, where does suffering come from? It is the result of man's disobedience. God says, do not kill. And what does man do? Man kills, and in doing so, creates the suffering that comes with this sin. And then there's the question of natural evil. What about natural evil? Disease, catastrophe. A little child has leukemia and dies. What did that child do? Dr. Henry Morris in his book, The Genesis Record, explains that after the fall of Adam, there was not only a broken relationship with God causing moral darkness resulting in evil and suffering, he says there was also social breakdown, evidenced by the shame that Adam and Eve felt and the murder of Abel by Cain. In addition to this, he claims that there was an ecological breakdown as well, beginning with the departure of Adam and Eve from the garden, the difficulty in childbirth and their toil to live from the earth, which was not there before. He goes on to show that social disintegration continued until the greatest natural disaster in history occurred, the Great Flood. In his book, he demonstrates how hydrologists, a hydrologist is a scientist who studies the effects of water on the earth. So in his book, he demonstrates how hydrologist scientists have done experiments to find out what would happen if the world was suddenly covered with water in a very short amount of time. And so his scientists built a model to simulate this phenomena in a lab. Here are some of the results of their findings. If all of a sudden the earth was covered, the entire earth covered with water, what would happen? Mm. And by the way, these scientists, they weren't ministers, they weren't preachers, they didn't have an agenda, they were just curious. What would happen? Well, the first thing they found out is if the earth was suddenly covered with water, like in the great flood, the earth would shift on its axis, causing the north and south poles to freeze. Secondly, this would drastically change the weather patterns, which would severely affect animals and plants. Thirdly, the Bible tells us that the earth was originally fed by underground streams and protected by a ring of vapor in the atmosphere, Genesis chapter seven, verse 11 which were both dissolved in order to create the flood. He says that without the vapor shield, one of the results was be that new strains of bacteria would enter into our environment, causing disease to man and beast and plants. Morris has a pretty long and detailed book, but essentially what he is saying is that the flood created an ecological disaster which explains the disease the imbalance in nature, the environmental catastrophes that have plagued man since that time. But however, the reason for the flood in the first place was man's sinfulness. Remember, the flood was sent by God because man was on the pathway to self-destruction since every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And I think this is one of the passages that Marty was talking about this morning. And again, we didn't discuss what we were going to be preaching in much detail. And so moral and natural evil can find their source in man's disobedience to God and his laws. Man disobeyed God's command and destroyed his relationship with God. He destroyed his relationship with other men and ultimately caused the breakdown of the very environment that God had created to sustain and to satisfy him. Do you ever think that God created the world for man's pleasure? Flowers smell sweet and beautiful, why? Because God created it that way. The sunset is magnificent, the sun warms our faces, why? Because God created that way. Sweet is sweet and, 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 and enjoyable. Why? Because God created us to enjoy. If you just thought about it just for a little while, all of the things that have been created have been created in such a way to give us pleasure, to give us joy. And man destroyed all of this through his disobedience. So where does evil come from? 
Well, it doesn't come from anywhere. It is the natural result that takes place when man violates God's will in any way. And so the next question is, why does God permit it then? In order to answer this question, we have to talk about free will, the topic of free will, the necessity of free will. God permits evil to exist because it is the downside of free will. And free will is necessary if man is to be made truly in the image of God. In Genesis 1:26, God said in creating man, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God had created the universe, the earth and its environment, the creatures that inhabit it, and completed this with the creation of man. Similar to the earth in that he was made from it and thus could perfectly interact with it. You know, man could breathe its air, eat its food, under, understand and dominate it and exploit it if he, for good. But he was also made similar to God as well so that he could interact with God. The only thing in creation that could do so. Only man interacts with God. In being similar to God in his image and likeness, this meant that man also shared godly attributes that plants and animals could not and did not. For example, God could communicate. Well, so could man. You know, God said, let there be light. He was communicating. Man said, the woman you gave me, Lord. Man also could communicate. God could perceive goodness and beauty. After all, God said, it is good, it is very good, when he saw what had been created. And so could man. Woman saw, uh, man saw Eve, Adam saw Eve, and he said, this is bone of my bones. He communicated. He was a, able to appreciate beauty. God had the power of creating. And by virtue of reproduction, so did man. God had will, most importantly. The ability to choose, after all, we read in the Bible that God says, let us make man in our image. That's a choice. And so does man. The choice to eat or not to eat of the forbidden fruit. He was given the power of free will. You see, without free will, man is not in the image of God. That's the important thing. He is less than human. He is not all that he was created to be. Man must be able to glorify God willingly and freely because worship which is not offered freely and willfully, which is automated, is no worship at all. It is an insult to Almighty God. In other words, in order to be in the image of God, man had to have, had to possess free will. Now here's the problem. The problem with free will is that man had the choice to obey and enjoy life in perfect harmony, without evil, without suffering, or disobey and destroy his relationship with God and other men, the creation itself, and bring evil and suffering into the world. He had the power to do both. We know the story, don't we? It should have been an easy choice. But because of the previous disobedience of Satan and his seductive ways, man chose to disobey and bring all of the calamity of suffering crashing down on his and, of course, our heads today. Now somebody might say, well, why create man at all if God knew that all of this evil and suffering was going to happen? Why did he do it? The answer to that question is that when God was faced with the choice to create or not to create, He chose to create man anyways. He chose to say, let us make man, because it was the right thing to do despite the suffering to come. To create was better than not to create. The fact that God chose to create indicates that this was the right choice. God didn't make a mistake. He didn't make a bad choice. He didn't use his free will incorrectly. Man is the one that used free will incorrectly. God did the supremely right thing in creating man with free will. It is man that has misused his free gift. But God is greater than man. And God is greater than evil or suffering because he had a way of dealing with the evil and suffering caused by man's bad choice 
and his failure to exercise his free will correctly. So this is the part of the lesson where we see God's response to evil. This is where evil comes from. Man's disobedience to God and all the ways that that has manifested itself throughout history. So how does God respond to evil? You know, evil exists in this world and it causes great suffering, absolutely. This is an undeniable fact. However, the mere existence of evil does not mean that God ignores or is not active in dealing or responding to evil in this world. There are a variety of ways that God confronts, deals with, and resolves the problem of evil in this world if we only take the time to note it. First of all, God limits evil. Now this is a terrible evil in this world and the rate of suffering is great, but from the very beginning God has used a variety of ways to limit the amount of evil and the scope of suffering. Believe it or not, it could be much worse. You know, one of the ways is the use of His power to, uh, to limit evil. One of the ways is that He limits the lifespan of man. Have you ever thought of that? Before the flood, when the earth was still in relative harmony, man lived for centuries. Notice that after the flood, man's lifespan diminishes to three score and 10. And then if there's strength, maybe another 10, another decade. This limits the time of evil men and their pursuits, as well as the time that good men must suffer. In the context of eternity, 50 or 60 years is not a very long time. I'm not minimizing the evil and the suffering that anyone has to suffer, but God has, has called us to an eternal life, and the life that we have here lasts only a few years in comparison. Secondly, God has created man in such a way that despite the sin within him and the weakness of his flesh, man is still capable of great good. Life still has an element of joy that comes from our appreciation of beauty and family and the delights of the creation around us and our work and our activities. God could have completely cursed us that there would be no possibility of joy on this earth, but He didn't. We can still find things to smile about despite the evil and the suffering in the world. This is God's doing, not Satan or man's. If it was up to Satan, there would never be any joy. I've said that to, to you before. Sometimes Satan can't tempt you to willfully sin against God, but sometimes he's able to just take your joy away from you. Sometimes he's able to distract us enough so that we don't enjoy what we have at hand. We start worrying about tomorrow, or we start feeling bad about yesterday, and we can't appreciate what God has given us today. That's the work of Satan, not God. And then God has provided knowledge to man to solve the problems here on earth caused by sin. Scientific breakthroughs, discoveries of medicine, technological advances, all of these things are possible. Why? Because of the mercy of God, that's why. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, but so does the sunshine on the just and on the unjust. All knowledge comes from God and the progress that man has made in understanding and exploiting the creation for his own good and the relief of suffering is nothing more than what God commanded in the garden when he said that man was to fill the earth and subdue it in Genesis 1 verse 27. Man has not improved his lot despite God. He has reduced suffering and mitigated much of the evil in the world through God's mercy and enlightenment. I mean, in the last 2,000 years, most major scientific discoveries have been made by believers, not atheists. Atheists keep putting forward you know, ideas and, and theories about how the world came to be and so on and so forth that are discounted you know, every, every 10 years or so. Another way that God responds to evil in the world, He limits the time that man has in the time of evil. Secondly, he, he uses evil to teach us something. You know, God doesn't arbitrarily remove evil because, because first of all, it is the direct result of man's choice. And to remove evil is to remove choice. And to remove choice is to eliminate man as a free thinking, independent, eternal being. We need free will if we're going to be eternal. 
One goes with the other. So God uses the evil in the world to teach mankind lessons about good. Things man once knew, but lost because of sin. Throughout the Bible, we have examples of this type of teaching. For example, Job. Job is a prime example of God's use of evil to teach and mature one of his sons. Job is the victim of both natural evil, you know, his children are killed by a storm that destroyed their home, and Job himself suffered from a terrible skin disease, and he's also a victim of moral evil. His servants and his property were plundered by attacking tribes. Job couldn't understand why a righteous man like himself should suffer from the effects of evil. He finally learned that he couldn't judge God and understand the universe based only on his limited experience. His experience was valid, but it was limited. His suffering taught him that he should trust God to run the universe. And even if there were some things wrong with the universe, things that caused Job to suffer, God was still capable of taking care of it and taking care of him too. The big problem with suffering is we think everything has fallen out of control. Maybe we're out of control, but God is never out of control. This is just one example of God's use of evil and suffering to teach important spiritual truths, but the Bible is full of stories where through the experience of hardship, God teaches men and women important lessons concerning hope and perseverance, mercy, forgiveness, and victory through the ongoing faith that we have in God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses seven to 10, Paul writes the following. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties um, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So Paul the Apostle served God faithfully. He succeeded in planting churches throughout the Roman world. He wrote a good portion of the New Testament and yet it was through his suffering and defeat that God was able to teach him the priceless lessons of contentment and trust and submission. Another person writes, James, he tells us that we should consider it all joy when we meet various trials. James 1 verse 2, why should we? Why should we rejoice when we, you know, when we experience trials in life? He answers, because through the evil and suffering in this world, God is able to teach us the most important lessons of our faith that cannot be taught in other ways. And then finally, God allows evil to exist, but not to win. God allows evil to exist, but not to win. People who become discouraged at the evil in the world and refuse to believe in God because of it, have a short view of history and a very small view of God. Evil has damaged the earth and caused suffering, but despite its worst attacks, people still rejoice when goodness in any form appears and seems on the rise. God has allowed evil to exist, but He has answered the problem of evil once and for all through His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, we've said that sin is the source of evil and death is its inevitable end, but Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty due for every sin of every person that ever lived. What does Peter say in 1 Peter 2? He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. Healed of what? The evil that's in your life, the sins that you have committed, that evil is healed by his suffering. The problem of evil, sin, was taken care of by the cross. The problem of death 
was overcome by Jesus' resurrection, John 6, 39 and 40. Evil and its result, death, are removed by God through the cross of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, His Son. And so evil exists now. It creates suffering now. It leads to death now. But God has dealt with evil, suffering, and death by first of all offering forgiveness for the evil that we do, by providing a measure of relief for the suffering that we experience as well as support and reassurance while we go through the trials, and finally a promise of resurrection and eternal life after death confirmed by the resurrection of Jesus and offered to everyone in the world through the gospel. And so evil and suffering exist, yes, there's no denying it, but God offers help for now and a promise for the future that one day there will be no more suffering, no more evil ever again. I think it's the thing that I hope for the most. You know, people say, boy, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this question. I'm going to ask God that question. You know, uh, who's the man of lawlessness? Or how did this work? Or why did you do that? I think the thing that I'm going to enjoy the most about heaven, no sin. Never mind no sin like in other people, no sin in me. <laughs> That's what I'm going to enjoy, no sin in me. And so I ask you the question, you know, are you a victim of evil in this world? Have you suffered because of injustice? Are you suffering because of illness or grief? Are you suffering because of the evil of others against you or simply because you've made some bad choices? Please know that even though God permits this evil and suffering to exist in this world, in your world, He also offers a solution to all suffering. And that solution, I repeat again, is Jesus Christ. It's why we're here. It's what we do. It's what the church does. It offers the solution to suffering. Isn't it sad that people see the evil in the world, but they refuse to accept the solution for all of this evil? Jesus Christ reveals and proves the existence of God. In Romans chapter, uh, in Romans chapter one, verse one to four, Paul, the bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power, how? By the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ removes the barriers of sin and condemnation and makes peace between God and ourselves. Romans chapter five, verse one. Therefore, having been justified by faith. Why do we have to be justified? Because there's evil in our life. That's why there needs to be justification. So therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ allows a person to be at peace with himself and have hope for the future. How do we know? Romans chapter eight, verse one. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you have no condemnation, you have no fear. And if you have no fear, you have the capability to love. And if you have the capability to love, then you have peace. That's the trajectory. And Jesus Christ empowers all who believe in Him to live in harmony and love with others in this world. How do we know this? Again, Paul says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world. Why? Because evil is in this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. If the Bible is true, 
then the worst evil a person can do in this world is to refuse to believe and obey Jesus Christ, the antidote to evil. And the greatest thing that a person can do in this life is to proclaim Christ as Lord. The very best thing you can do to love your neighbor and to love the world is to participate in the proclamation of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. It is within your power tonight to stop the evil, perhaps not all the evil in the world, but to stop the evil in your own life today, if you have not already done so. Come then, confess your faith in Jesus. Come, return to serve Him today. Come and be baptized. Wipe away the sins, wipe away the evil in your life and begin to live for and through Christ, proclaiming that He and only He is the answer to the evil in this world. If you need to respond to our invitation tonight, then Brother Dayton, lead us in a song and we ask you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing.